think, and, and I think this is the one you have to pick. Oh, you're right. I guess it is. But, okay. Um, calling the Finance Committee meeting for um, March 12, 2019, to order at 10 minutes after 2. And uh, I'm going to thank Amherst Media for once again uh, being present and working with us as we're going through the transition of trying to um, establish a system of um, recording through other means than their presence uh, each time, but we're glad to have you here today. Um, so we have a fairly uh, significant agenda, and uh, I wanted to propose a, a shift on orders, and I'm going to make a very quick announcement because it's an easy one. Um, question had arisen about remote participation. And um, I checked with the town clerk, who's the, also the clerk of the council, and she confirmed that we do not need to have a vote of this body, the committee, to allow remote participation, that remote participation um, is uh, automatically a part of our practice but that there is a form that needs to be filled out by a member who wishes to participate remotely and submitted according to the policy that was adopted by the select board. Um, and it is available um, in, in the committee page under select board. I assume that it might be elsewhere, but I just wanted to alert you to that since the question had come up. If you don't have a copy of the agenda, there's some extras here. so. Pass them back, uh, but it was the same as posted. So getting to the order, what I would propose that we do is uh, in the order that's there is to take numbers two and three, which is the financial consideration of the statement of interest to the MSBA and the funding for identified major projects is the first item. Is sort of a, they are together really, so uh, while they're listed separately, it is one item, and do that first, then do the review of the March 7 budget forum. Third is review and consider uh, the uh, suggested changes to the committee charge and uh, look at our work, see if there are any modifications we want to make to our schedule and work plan, something that um, we said we would put on every agenda, even though we didn't anticipate we would make changes every meeting, and um, then public comment um, in that order. Is that agreeable? Okay. Then uh, I think that we would like to get to that first combined item of the um, state financial considerations to the statement of interest and the funding uh, plan and uh, turn it over to you, Sean. Thank you. So, be oh, and yes, we have a minute taker. Thank you. So, before I start, uh, just two things. So, I've got some chest stuff going on. So, if I pause periodically for a cough drop or water, just be, be a second. Um, and I'm going to go through the presentation quickly, but I'm going to try to speak slowly. So if, if you catch me not speaking slowly, raise your hand and correct me, okay? All right, so we're going to start um, with a presentation and then I'm going to bring up that model that we talked about in the past. So here's what we're gonna discuss. We're gonna start with just, you know, based on what I've looked at, can we afford some version of all these projects? Um, we'll quickly go through the assumptions. A lot of them you've seen before, but I just wanted to lay them out again for you so you kind of know what's being put into the, the models. Um, we'll look at the cost estimates for a few options. Um, or we'll look at the cost estimates for all the projects, and then we'll look at different options for how to phase those projects or different versions of those projects. Um, we'll talk briefly about some of the operating cost considerations and then some of the capital cost considerations and then next steps. Um, and at the end, then I'll bring up the model that is almost ready for sort of a public sort of thing, 
uh, but I'll talk about what I want to try to do first before we put it up for the public to play around with. So let me make this a little smaller. So this little disclosure, um, read this, this is just us saying basically these are all estimates, um, you know, as you see fit, apply ranges to it, you know, it could be 10% higher, 10% lower. Um, we're using sort of inputs that we've got from previous um, architectural reports and things like that, but again, these are estimates with a lot of assumptions built in, so um, it's in the ballpark, but you'll have to range it. Um, also, it's a, sort of a living thing, as we get more information, we'll, we'll update the models. And lastly, um, we looked at some of these options. We looked at five options in particular. There are many other options that could be really feasible and desirable that haven't been looked at. So by no means are the options that are presented here the only options. There could be other models to look at. So can the town afford these projects? Um, and I think based on what I've seen, yes, there is um, ways for the town to afford these projects. Uh, it's going to require really prudent planning and budgeting. Um, I think based on sort of the, the amounts that have been put out there in prior architectural reports, those costs are gonna have to be reined in a little bit. Um, but looking at those hard and setting some budgets and some cost restrictions on what we think these projects might end up at, um, there, there is a way to afford all of them. Um, we have to take advantage of available grant funds. So, so sort of, can we afford these projects? We have to do all of these things in this list. Um, not, if we don't do any of these things in this list, then we might not be able to afford these projects. Um, we have to plan for these projects in a way that keeps our debt load below the legal debt ceiling. So given the number of projects and the short time span we're looking at them, um, you know, we are going to, that, that debt ceiling is going to be a consideration um, and you, we can't go over it. So um, you'll see in the models that we're testing each of the options for, does it go over that debt ceiling? Um, that is, is, I think it's 5% of our combined EQV, Sonia? Yeah. Um, so you'll see what that looks like. And then also it's gonna require town approval of one or more debt exclusions. So in all the models that you're gonna, going to see, uh, we assumed a debt exclusion for one school and the library. So in some of the models, there are two schools being proposed. One of those schools is assuming a debt exclusion. Um, in the models where there's only one school being proposed, that school is being uh, assumed to be a debt exclusion. Um, some of the assumptions, so the first few you've seen, borrowing rate 5%, we got that from our the town financial advisor. Uh, cost escalation, that was from JCJ Architects, who provided a range of four to four and a half percent. That's also the rate that um, TSKP Architects used in their models of four uh, percent. Net zero premium, I'm using 7.5. The range I got from um, JCJ Architects was five to 10. The TSKP models range somewhere between six and 12, depending on the different options. So went in the middle. Um, it's really gonna depend on how those projects, those buildings are designed. MSBA effective reimbursement rate. So for a new school construction, assuming 50% reimbursement rate. For a addition renovation, assuming 55% because of the additional reimbursement points for a renovation project. We did get some estimates from TSKP um, recently of their ranges of reimbursements, and these numbers are within their ranges. Um, so it's gonna vary based on schematic design and ultimately what's eligible to the MSBA, um, but it's within the ranges that TSKP set, and it's, it's reasonable based on what our reimbursement rate was last time, uh, last time we had a school building project. Uh, ongoing capital, so one of the uh, pieces of feedback received last time was we have to build in an assumption around ongoing capital needs outside of these four building, four or five building projects. Um, so the amount that's being used right now, which is a variable that you'll be able to play with in the model, is 2.5 million. That's roughly half of what's available for capital projects right now, or about 5 million, um, which is the, the 10 per, or 9 to 10% of the tax levy. So again, it's gonna take some real belt tightening to make this all work, which we knew we would have to, right, to, to afford all these projects. Um, the good thing is if we do at least one of these, some of these projects, some of the capital items come off of that capital plan. So it will make it a little easier to handle that. Um, tax levy growth, so we're assuming two and a half percent. This number basically uh, is used to show what the amount available for capital is. So if the tax levy goes up roughly 2.5% per year, then the 10% the of that goes up the same rate. Um, 
you know, that's an assumption that is good probably for five to 10 years, um, depending on new growth and things like that, that could change in the future. So just to be cautious of that, um, you know, we're assuming 2.5 going forward, but that's no, there's no guarantee of that. And if you have questions as we go, I feel free to ask them, if it's okay with the chair. So now we have that answered, so go ahead. Okay. Ongoing capital, 2.5 million, and then you say that's half of what is spent today. I, my brain is not putting that together. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you, what you mean. So right now, we take 10, um, 9 percent of the tax levy um, to, to devote towards the, uh, the funds for JCPC and what's used to prioritize projects. Um, and so that about today is about five, in the ballpark of five million. So all the projects that JCP, JCPC is considering have to live within that amount. Um, going forward, we're gonna have to pull some of those funds to pay for these projects, these four or five new building projects. So that money that JCPC has, that five million, some of that now is gonna have to go to pay the debt service for these new projects, which is gonna leave less for the remaining needs of the town. This was money not to be used for the small capital projects, not buildings. Is that right? So this is money. So the five million, basically, the way the town works is each year that ten percent or nine percent of the tax levy is devoted towards capital. Um, so all the needs right now for capital are coming out of that ten percent. When we do these building projects, that ten percent is going to have to cover those building projects as well. So this assumption is basically just saying we're gonna to have to reduce how much can be used for things like roads and um, regular building up, uh, improvements that we make every year. Um, we're gonna to have to reduce the amount of money for that in order to afford the debt service for these new buildings. Well, uh, that just does seem strange because we've been talking about lack of maintenance on all kinds of town buildings and this would then continue lack of maintenance because there wouldn't be any money to do small things. Well, so there'd be 2.5 million to do the, so basically the 2.5 million here is what's gonna be available for all the small things. Now, some of those things aren't super small, right? Some of them are sizable, um, but the 2.5 million is what would be available. Now, in addition to that, there are um, chapter 90 funds, which are separate from that. Um, there are other sources of revenues that are separate from that, but the, the portion of the tax levy would be the 2.5 million. But you're right, that's, I mean, that's one of the realities to, to afford all these projects is we were gonna have to tighten this piece mm -hmm. of it. Okay, Paul. So I, th I think those are really good points that Dorothy's making, but I think it would be good for Sean to get through his model before, and you can change that number. You say, I wanna do $3 million or $4 million. You can change that and see what it does and say, well, oh, if we do $4 million, we can't afford one of these projects. Which one do we knock off? Mm -hmm. So it's, I don't think it's worth debating now whether it's a good number or not. Just he made some assumptions, which is what this is an assumption, and you can change that assumption. Yeah, I, um, I was going to build on the point you just made. If we take a mortgage out on our house, we're going to have to repay the principal, so we have less for everything else. Just on the um, zero net energy, the premium, you're just applying that to the ones where it's not already built in. Yeah, right? so you'll see it, but the one that is... school, we've built it in. Essentially, it's being applied to the fire station and the DPW. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Um, so some other assumptions. So the town shared the library project. Um, you know, there's some fundraising built in there. There's grants. So the, the, the number that ultimately the town would pay, that number came from the library director. So just so you're aware of where that figure came from. Um, year of construction is an estimate. So again, that's a variable you'll be able to adjust in the models when you play around with it. The projects to be debt excluded, we use the school, or one school and the library. You can also adjust that in the model if you want to try different things. Uh, da, da, da. Cost of, um, so cost of moving sixth grade to the middle school. So recently the um, regional master facility use study group um, looked at that closely. They brought in the old principal of the middle school back when there were many more students in the middle school. And they have uh, identified a way that you can move the sixth grade into the middle school um, without any significant capital costs, essentially. There may be some um, capital things you want to do, but there are no required capital things to fit the sixth graders in. Um, and there, we're gonna be looking at that model more this Friday with the regional master facility use group, um, and more of that will be presented in the future. But basically, there is a way to fit the sixth graders into the middle school as it is now. Um, now, that what's different than if we build an addition at Crocker Farm. So if you go with the option of building addition at Crocker Farm, we're estimating five to 10 million. So 
out of all the estimates, there's two that I feel sort of least strongly about, and so this is one of them, because we don't really have a, a great way to estimate this. The way we've estimated it so far is we've looked at some of the MSBA guidelines around you know, how many square footage would you need for classrooms and special ed spaces. We took the additional students that would be brought over and how many would be per classroom, essentially, um, and then multiplied that total square footage addition that we would need by the, the rates from the TSKP report. Um, th I don't think there's any guidance at this point what the model would actually look like at Crocker Farm if an addition was built there, if it would just be all the, class, all the grades would be a little bit bigger to absorb those 100, 137 students or if there'd be something else. Um, so again, this number is probably the, one of the weakest here just because we don't know what that looks like yet. And can I just ask, it's your best guess right now of if to, the getting from the 750-ish down to 600, all of them went into Crocker, not some, some part of them went up to the middle no, school. No, right, it's all of them going to Crocker. It's all yeah. into Crocker. Yeah, so basically I took, or on these, yeah. Yeah, I okay. took the enrollments at Fort River and Wildwood today, okay. less 600, and so that's where the 137 comes from. That would have to move. So that does include six. Sorry. It includes sixth grade, yep. And I also looked at some comparable MSBA projects, new constructions that were similar size or similar number of students and then scaled it down to the square footage. And then again, it comes out between five and 10 million, but there's a lot of questions. Would there be other code upgrades that are required in the building? Um, that building does have some sprinklers, so there, you know, some of the major ones maybe are covered, but um, again, that's, that's a big question that would have to be studied more. Okay. So, here are the cost estimates. Again, you'll want to apply your own ranges as you see fit, but this is where, what we're using to put into the model. Um, so the library is the same number you've seen. It's 35,600,000, uh, and it's based on a 35,600,000 yeah, 35, based on a year of construction of 2023. Um, the DPW, so the DPW and the fire station, we originally started using the numbers that came out of their architectural reports, and I'll be honest, when we projected those forward with cost escalation, they became really sort of unrealistic, just in terms of the cost and how quickly they grew. Um, so these numbers, we actually set some caps at, at, going back and looking at this. So we set the DBW at a, a base year cost of 25 million, and the fire station at a base year cost of 20 million. So just to bring something to you today that is reasonable, we had to do that, basically. Um, otherwise, it was just the cost escalation was getting out of control. Um, so that's still going to grow as we go forward, but that's what we put in for our base. But that includes the net zero. Um, so if you scroll, if you keep going down that column, so the DPW, we're, we're projecting the year of construction of 2025. Yeah. So that would have nine years of escalation. That gives you the 35.6 million uh, preliminary cost estimate, and then there's the net zero, net net zero yeah. premium added in. So the, in 2025, we're projecting the cost to be about 38 million using the 25 as, uh, from this year as a base. Yeah, go ahead, Lynn. So this is playing with the model, mm -hmm. but in other words, if we were able to build either of those sooner, <coughs> right, you'd have less we cost save money. Yep, and so in the model, I'm gonna let you guys test out soon. You can play around with the year of construction, you can play around with the cost escalation factor, you can adjust the base cost estimate if you want to make that lower or higher. Um, you'll be able to adjust for all those things. But this 2025 is what we use for now. Um, the next one's the fire station. That one we adjusted down a little bit to 20 million, and that one we're projecting the year of 2027 just because of the, the relationship between that and the DPW. Um, and the same thing, cost escalation um, here is the, it's, it's farther in the future, but the years of escalation are less because the, the base year is escalated already. So the base year for the fire station of around 20 million, that was based on a year of construction of 2020 um, from the architect's report. So that's, if you get confused by the, why the years of escalation are less, it's just because that number was already in the future to start. Um, and so the total cost for the fire station in 2027, we're projecting at 28.3 million. And then the rest are just, there's really three of them, but they're each, under each option, it's an ad reno versus new construction. So there's the 315 student model, uh, new school, and then ad reno option. There's the 420 student option, new and ad reno, and the light yellow. And then there's the 600 student, new and ad reno. And so the, the second number that I 
referred to before that I have sort of the least confidence in is the ad reno for the 600 student school. Um, because the addition, the possible addition for a 600 student school could be much different than what was proposed in the TSKP reports, I just don't feel as good about that number that we're extrapolating out. Um, but this will give you a sense, and it, if anything, I think that number is a little high for the ad reno for the 600 students, but um, that's what the rates are coming out to right now. So, um, and the other thing with ad renos is when you look at comparables or what you think are comparables on the MSBA website, there's a wide range of what renovation is needed at all those schools, so they're not really easy to compare to, essentially. Some schools need a total gut job, some schools don't. Um, so again, that's the second number that I feel least confident about. Uh, Kathy, you had a question? Yeah, um, when you're looking at two schools rather than one, um, you know, you've got a couple of different ways of getting to two, which is one's an ad mono and one's a new. Um, realistically, one would come, just because of the way the grant funding comes, would come much later than the first. So I'm wondering whether you shouldn't put, um, you've got a one-year escalation factor there. Right. Um, so I don't know what the best number is, whether you say seven, but, you know, you're, you, because we can't be in the queue at the same time. So that's one of the options we haven't looked at. So all the, the options you're going to see in a minute, all of them assume we do both schools at the same time. So one with MSBA funds, one without MSBA funds. And the reason we're doing that is we wanted to give you a sense because what I've heard from some of the communities is that we can't do one school and wait to do another school. Just, there could be such a long time in between and there could be some equity issues there. So these options assume we do one school, or do both schools at the same time, one MSBA funded, one not MSBA funded. But again, that's something if you wanted to look at the alternative of what if we do wait to do them, you can do that in the model. And I, I did, the reason I'm raising, I think that that's a reasonable thing to mm -hmm. put in, and then you could, as you've pointed out, we could put in seven years from now. Right. Um, I just don't want two to look like the same price as one. Right. Which they're, they're very near right now because, right. you know, in the raw prices, sure. um, because they, they aren't realistically as near as they are if you talk about needing... In the future, right. It, yep. yep. Um, and then below, just again, the, so the moving sixth grade to the middle school, you wouldn't have to add any cost um, at this point to those last two options on the end. If you build an addition at Cracker Farm, then you would add five to ten million to those two options at the end for the 600 student school. Um, I'm, go ahead. Well, there's one option you didn't con consider. Mm -hmm. um, there's many options I haven't considered. Build the 600 school without state aid. <clears throat> In other words, if they don't give us the go ahead now, are we gonna wait and go through this right. whole thing again? Yeah, no, that Just hasn't go been. ahead and build it. Right, no, we haven't considered that. Not yet, again, we could, we could look at it. Yeah. So when you go back to the previous slide, when you are saying school new stu new 315 students, school ad reno, that's not saying here's two schools. It's saying here's how to get one school with 315. Yeah, maybe that's unclear. So yeah. this is basically each one of those is one school. So school new 315, 59.5 million. That's the cost for one new 315 student school. The ad reno is for one ad reno school. Um, at 315 students, that would be the 46.7 million. So if you were going to do two schools, you would add those, you'd do double that, and then subtract out any grant funding. Does that make sense? He's given us a way to get to 750 with two schools if we were to go that route. Right, so if you wanted to get to roughly 750, you would say, I need to do one 315 student school, one 420 student school, that gets you to 735. Um, and that would be sort of your ballpark cost for that. Just, just to make sure I completely mm -hmm. understand this, we could also say two 315 new schools. I'm not saying we can afford that, but if you were, then we would be saying 59,499. If you did two 315 student schools, you'd probably have to then think about moving sixth grade to the middle school or an addition of Crocker Farm because you'd only get to 630 students, which wouldn't cover all the students needed. But what I was, the point I'm making is, if you were going to give some school, some students a brand new school, and some students a renovated school, then you have the two options. Yeah. I'm looking yep. for a little bit of equity. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yep. And the nice thing about the way he's done it, Lynn, is if we multiply your two new schools, then you can compare it to the cost of 
one new school at 600, so. And these are still just inputs. Again, these aren't any proposals. These are just inputs that you'll then take to put into the, the model, basically, the, the total cost that you come up with. You'll pull that number, pop it into the model to project out the debt. But, but the MSBA number is not counted in. It's not Not yet. You'll, you'll see yeah. it in, on the next, yeah. or in a, in a few minutes. <coughs> Shawnee, did you have a question? Hello. Yeah, I'm still not clear what ad reno means. So ad reno, so TSKP looked at lots of options. And so one of the options they looked at is an addition renovation, which means some portion of the building would be renovated, and then they would build an addition. And they looked at different size additions. So they looked at a very small addition. They looked at 50% addition, essentially. They looked at a lot of different levels. Yep. Good. Okay. So these were the four original options that I said we were going to uh, look at and come back with numbers on. And I've given you a bonus option, so you get five for the work of four um, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but essentially, the fire station, DPW, and library, under all the options, are new, and those are the years that they're projected to be constructed. The first two options look at replacing um, Fort River and Wildwood with some version of a Fort River and Wildwood, either new construction or ad reno. Um, and under each of those, one school we would get MSBA funds, and one school would be without MSBA funds, just so you can see if, if that's possible. And we brought it one year forward from what you saw last time. Last time we looked at uh, 2021 as the year of construction. That seems less realistic at this point. So we've escalated that forward one year to 2022. And then option three and four is the 600 student school. Option three is with the addition of Cracker Farm. And option four is with the sixth grade going to the middle school. So those were the two ways to get to the 600 students. Um, and both would assume MSBA funds for all the construction costs which is not a guarantee, um, but that's the assumption for now. All right, so all the options have basically two pages, so each option has two pages to it. Um, at the top of each of these pages is sort of a reminder of what you're looking at and what we're projecting out. So this option one, this is a, what we're calling a three school option, so you're gonna be left with three elementary schools at the end of this. Um, and it would be those, the two projects would be new construction. So that it wouldn't be at Reno, it would be the new construction for Wildwood and Fort River. So you've got the total cost, you've got the, the five projects in each of those columns, you've got the total cost for each of those projects, any grant funds that are available. Um, so for the library, you can see the, the grant funds and that would also include fundraising. For the elementary school, uh, Fort River, we're assuming MSBA funds of a 50% reimbursement and then nothing for Wildwood, because we're assuming we're doing that without MSBA funds. Uh, the town cost is the net of those two numbers. Um, debt excluded just says, are we excluding this project's debt? And so you can see we're saying yes for the library, no for DPW, no for fire station, no for the Fort River project, but yes for the Wildwood project. I, I need you to go. This is where I need you to go. Slower, okay. <laughs> All right. So this chart at the top, this is gonna be on the same chart, the same layout of the chart you'll see on all the different options. And it's basically a summary of what's being projected below. So you've got the library. Each of those columns is, is the information for each of the different projects. So you can, if you look at the top, you'll see library, DPW, fire station, Fort River and Wildwood. When we get to the options that have the 600 student school, you'll see Fort River and Wildwood go away and in, in exchange it'll be a 600 student school. The first row there, total cost, so that's the total cost that comes from that previous screen we looked at of the, the projected cost. Where, where am I um, so at the top, you Is see where it says total cost there? on the left? Oh, yeah. Right there. I see the words, but the, 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 there's no numbers. Because those are library numbers. Okay. The full cost. See total cost. So the care is that number. Okay, but as for the library, I thought he meant for all of these projects. Yeah, I could understand. Yeah, it's not for you. Okay. It's changing. Okay, that's. When you said total cost, I thought you meant all projects. Right, no, I mean, sorry, total cost for each individual project. I got that. Yeah, okay. Then below is the grant funds for each individual project. So for the library, the 19.7, that came out of um, a report that uh, the library director shared with me. So it's a combination of the MBLC grant funds 
and private fundraising and things of that nature. We don't have any grant funds for the DPW or the fire station. We're assuming MSBA reimbursement of 50% for Fort River. So you'll see roughly a 50% reimbursement there, that negative 31.9 million. And then we're assuming no MSBA for Wildwood because we're gonna do that at the same time and that would be a non-MSBA project. The next row down is just a net of those two numbers. So, it's, so the library cost is the 35.6, less than 19.7, leaves you with the 15.9, which is the number that's been uh, presented. Um, the DPW, again, those are the same numbers because there's no grant funds. For Fort River, you've got the net town cost of 31.9 million, and then the Wildwood School with no grant funds, you've got the cost of the town of 59.5 million. Good so far? The next column, or next row down, says whether the project's debt was excluded. And so the, the importance of that is, if it's excluded, then we don't have to look at it in terms of does it fit under the 10% um, of the tax levy that we use for capital projects, because there's gonna be a separate revenue source from the taxpayers to pay that debt. So the library, we're assuming the debt is excluded. The DPW, no. The fire station, no. Uh, the first school project, Fort River, no and the Wildwood project, yes. And then lastly, the start date is just sort of a reminder to give you a sense of when the debt kicks in. Uh, 2020, 20, 2023 for the library, 2025 for DPW, 2027 for the fire station, and then 2022 for both schools. And whether they could literally be done at the exact same time is a question, but again, just for illustration purposes. And then the table all the way at the right is just a reminder of some of the key assumptions that are being used. So the borrowing rate, 5%, cost escalation, 4%, net zero premium, 7.5, MSBA reimbursement, 50%, and ongoing capital, 2.5. And all of those are variables we can influence. So for example, yeah. even the borrowing rate, um, yeah. I looked recently at municipals. So if I go out 20 years, it's not getting much more than 3%, right. you know, in terms of an investor buying them. So mm -hmm. this is on the, you're certainly being conservative. Yeah. Again, we went, we went with what our yeah. financial advisor said, which given some of the uncertainty, but you're right, I think rates are a little bit, are less than the 5% currently, but. And then the other question, um, this is sort of a bottom line question that we'll see as you iterate these. <laughs> um, does the world look any better? This is a pretty ugly picture right here. That's, but does where, the it bonus, will, that's where the bonus option comes in. So the okay. bonus option, and so what, does the world look any better when you spread these out even more over time? Um, it would. I, I don't have any options here okay. that spread it out past um, 2027 um, because okay. we want to look at sort of doing these projects in a tighter timeline. But the more you stretch them out, the more affordable they yeah, get. Yeah, because they, they get more expensive as a project, but other right, but projects are debt. winding down yeah. in terms of what we're paying off. In terms of the debt ceiling, you spread it out more. You're right. The, the overall cost gets more okay. expensive, but the... Um, Okay. How it relates to the debt ceiling and the, how it relates to the percentage of the capital funds we have to spend on them, you can be more flexible. All right, so I'm going to go to the, there's three charts for each option as well. Before you go there, mm -hmm. you have this odd shaped star and it says 46.5 million over. That's the first chart. Okay. I was going to go right there. That's next. why I called right. it the ugly chart. Okay. <laughs> So th this is a version of the chart you've already seen. I've tried to take some of your input and factor it in, make it a little simpler, but also put in some stuff that's what you've requested. So um, essentially what this shows is from 2019 through 2057, um, that the black line, that's the funds we have available for capital. And that's for all capital. So that's for, that's the 10% that's the 10 of the tax levy. We assumed we got to 10%. So, Again, it grows a little bit every year as our total tax levy grows. That's why you see it scaling up in the future. Um, but that would be sort of our upper limit of what we can afford if we're gonna use the funds we already have set aside for capital. Good? Okay. And that is also, just to round that out, that's the same pot of money we have for JCPC to do all those smaller projects that we talked about earlier. All those smaller projects have to live within that 10% as well. So the, if you start in 2019, the existing debt, that's the runoff of all the debt we currently have on the books, that's, that's general fund debt, and so that's relatively low and it's winding down. The next bar is the assumption we talked about um, 
for ongoing capital needs. So up until around 2021, it's basically using up all the available funds. But in anticipation of the project starting in 2021, you'll see it goes down to the 2.5 million, which is a variable you can adjust. And we also have that scaling up as well. So we realized the 2.5 million, that would be a first year thing, but we also have that growing at, I think, 2.5% as well going forward. So you'll see that yellow bar grow in the future because we assumed we want to hold that constant if the tax levy is growing as well. Then the next one is the green bar that starts in 2022. So that would be the debt for Fort River. That is not debt excluded. You won't see the Wildwood debt on here. You won't see the Wildwood debt on here because cough drop. some time. Sure. Oh, you got one? Good. Oh, I've got a bunch of them, too. It's been a rough few weeks. So you won't see Wildwood debt on here because it's debt excluded. So that's coming from a different source than these 10% of funds. In 2025, you'll see the gray bar pop up. That's the next project. Um, or sorry, in 2023, the library project would begin, but that's also debt excluded, so you won't see that on this chart because that's coming out of a separate pot of money. Then in 2025, you'll see the DPW kick in. You can see that's when we push up well above the, the available funds. And then in 2027, the fire station kicks in. And so that ugly star in the middle of 46.5 million which will also be in the sheet you can play around with so you can see what that number is under the different options you look at. That's how much above, in total, for all the years combined, how much above that 10% we are. So essentially we would have to find 46.5 million, which we don't have, um, reduce the project somehow by that amount, um, or space things out more to, to stay under. Because the debt exclusion is already taken account of. Yeah, right. I mean, you're already, this, this also assumes a debt exclusion. So you're, you're well over the available funds under this model and you're excluding debt for two projects. So the taxpayers are kicking in additional funds already. And I'll show you how much in a second. Look at that, what a guy. So does this chart make sense? And this will be the one that you can, this will be the, all these charts actually will adjust as you play around with the variables. Um, but this is the main, one of the main ones to look at. I just, I just want to correct one thing. It's really not an ugly star. It just sticks out mm -hmm. like it should. I want it, yeah. I meant an ugly story, not the, the picture is quite elegant. Right. But this isn't, I mean, this shouldn't surprise anybody. I mean, we've heard this for a while that there's really very few places that have ever done a project without MSBA funds. Um, and then you add into the fact the other projects on top of that, that, you know, it shouldn't be surprising that it's somewhat unaffordable. So the next chart is the debt ceiling analysis. So our debt ceiling is about 105 million. That could fluctuate in the future. We just kept it flat at that 105 million for now because that could go up as, as new growth happens and as things grow. If there's a recession, it could come back down a little bit if, if values depreciate. So we just kept it at the flat 105 um, million. But just note that that could scale up a little bit as well. Um, so under this, the debt pay payments, and so this, these debt payments are all the debt payments, including the, the projects that are debt excluded. So this would include the library debt payments and one of the school debt payments in addition to the other projects. Um, so you can see we go quite a bit above the debt ceiling, and, which we're not allowed to. So again, that was to illustrate that this model doesn't work necessarily from an affordability standpoint, and it also doesn't work from a legal standpoint. And then this last chart is just to show what the taxpayer would feel. So this is the impact from the debt exclusion. Um, the first one would hit in 2021 from the school, and then the second one would hit around 2023. Um, note these years will be a couple years off because you know when the projects have started and when the debt actually happens and when things like that actually happen, there, there's gonna be a little bit of a timing gap there. Um, but essentially this is how it would feel to a taxpayer. So this is on a house that is, 
I confirm this, it's the average household val value in town or average property value in town of 354000 So they're, the increase to their tax bill, they've already got a significant tax bill, right? The increase to their tax bill would be $700 starting in 2021, which would be the high point for the school project. And then it would go up to about $900 in 2023 when the library project would kick in. And then it would just go down from there because there would be no further debt exclusions under this plan. So the high point um, under this scenario would be the $900 in 2023. And this would be, again, on an average, um, on an average house. Um, we can give you sort of the figures basically to figure out what it would be on any house. Well, we can provide that. Um, you, you, the assumption that it goes down is based on the assumption that you're not going to do anything in 2038 or 2040. It assumes you're not, not going to do any more debt exclusions. New. Yeah. So the reason it goes down is so it's tied to your debt payments each year. So the models of debt payments are declining debt payments as you pay the principal down. <coughs> there's other, there's other models get, for that, but what? You would never really get there because you'd be building something new. Only if you did another debt exclusion, which we wouldn't necessarily do another debt exclusion, but you're right. If you did another debt exclusion, then this chart would change in the future. So those are the three charts that, again, <coughs> same for, the, the charts look different, but it's the same charts for each option of what they're looking at. So I'll go through the next few options a little quicker, um, just so we can get to the conclusion. Um, but again, it's gonna be a similar format for each of the options. That's, so that's all option one, three schools. So you're, you're replacing two schools with two new construction, new constructed schools, um, and then doing the other projects as we discussed. All right, so this is option two. It's the exact same as option one, except for instead of new construction, for the schools, it has addition renovation for the schools. So it's a little cheaper, or a little less expensive. Um, the only difference on the assumption table is that instead of 50% for MSBA reimbursement rate, it's 55 because the renovated boost. The debt exclusion assumptions are the same. Um, the total costs for the schools are a little bit lower. Um, interestingly enough, you know, I don't know if this was a mistake, I can, I can try to verify this, but interestingly enough, the ad rental cost for a 420 student school was the same as the ad rental cost for a 315 student school under the TSKP report, the, the most recent thing they put out there. Now that may be because the building already is big enough to support 400 kids, so going from 315 to 420 doesn't make a huge difference. Um, but just note that, that's something that looks a little quirky because you have larger students, but the cost is the same. So, Affordability here, the, the, over, the, the amount we go over the available funding is a little bit less, it's 32.9 million um, because the school project is, is less expensive. Um, the amount that we go over the debt ceiling, a little bit less, but we're still well over it. And the impact uh, from the debt exclusions is a little bit less because the, again, it's a cheaper school project. So you only hit a high of about 750. Um, as opposed to 900 under the previous model. So option two, same as option one, just add reno instead of new construction. Any questions so far on option two? Actually, this, this, pertains, this pertains to any of the options where we boot, use both the Wildwood site and the Fort River site, mm -hmm. which we would be doing if we were doing two renos are you using the figures from the Fort River study for the renos? Yes, yep, that's the basis we're using for both schools because okay. that's the most recent figures we have on a school. Right? There's, there probably would be some subtle, maybe more subtle, but some differences between the costs between the sites just because of the land itself is a right. little different, um, but that, that is the assumption we're using is the same cost. Thank um, you. Yep. Does this include the the incentive that MSBA gives for net zero buildings, 2% or something like that? Yeah, so the, so the TSKP came out with a range of reimbursements that includes, includes those incentives, um, but it also is a wide range because they don't know what, what's eligible, what's not eligible. So the 50 and the 55 is really, again, it's within the range that TSKP, it assumes all those incentives, but 
that number could vary, you know, 5% more, 5% less. Yep. The, um, the, the project we did with Wildwood, the reimbursement rate was 51%, and that also took advantage of at least some of the um, energy incentives. It wasn't net zero, that wasn't a requirement, but it was lead, gold, or something. Um, so that 51% included bonus points as well. Okay, out of curiosity, in case I'm asked, um, when I went to the Fort River Feasibility Study, they had, um, they had a, a B and a C option, but both had the reno in it, and they both qualified for zero net energy. Did you use the B or the C? One was 50% reno, one was, you know, you, like there were six different ways. Yeah, I think it, I used the... One, did you use... I'll, I'll send you the exact. I think I used the E, to be honest, because I wanted to get the range of... So for the new construction, I used the A figures. Yeah. Um, and I think for the ad reno, I used the E figures to give the so range. So you used the lowest end of what they Yeah, for the ad reno, I used... Just to, again, try to give you... If you're trying to range it, to give you that range of it. Okay. Yep. So there's actually... So there's A through E, and then there's a code upgrade. So there's actually six different yeah. sections. But the E doesn't take care of the open classroom problem does, it, did it? Everything they did did open classrooms. Other right? than one. I think the code update didn't yeah. do, take care of it, but I think the... Yeah. Okay. The uh, chart, the, the third one, the affordability. The affordability is the, I'm trying to look, the 10% of levy is what we've allocated for uh, capital. Mm -hmm. is, so is the 32.9 the total of the, of the bars that are above that level? Yeah, so if you take the, the bars that are, have exceeded that 10% for all the years that they exceed the 10%, the sum of that is 32.9 million. So uh, an obvious alternative, not one that I in any way recommend whatsoever, but it is there is to cut the operating budget right. and increase the 10%, um, which gets back into the question of which of our vital departments are we not funding. Right. Yeah. And again, it's 32.9 million, 32 million aggregate. It wouldn't be per year. Um, so again, it's an aggregate number. So per year, you'd have to look at changes per year. Um, but yeah, that's a, another alternative. All right, I'm going to go to option three. So option three is a two-school option. So this is replacing Fort River and Wildwood with a new 600-student school. Um, and this first model is assuming an addition at Crocker Farm. So the first three columns haven't changed in that top table. The new school column is in there now. Um, the 89 million is the new 600-student school from the cost estimate page. Plus, I think it was about seven million I added for the addition at Crocker Farm. So it adds in a, uh, somewhere in the middle of that range for uh, work at Crocker. And then we assume 50% reimbursement because the majority of this would be new construction, um, which would leave a town cost of 44.5 million. We would exclude the school. So again, my, what I said in the beginning is under all the options, we assume one school and the library. So under this option, we would assume the school and, and the library. And this would be 2022 as well. So under this option, the amount we go over is closer, right? It's down to 11.9, which makes sense because the cost for the uh, schools to the town is much less. Um, it still creeps up over the debt ceiling for a couple of years, um, which would be a problem that we have to figure out a way to deal with. Um, you know, we, we've talked to our financial advisor and we don't want to go over the debt ceiling. We don't really want to be close to the debt ceiling either. We want to be comfortably below the debt ceiling um, to maintain sort of a, uh, you know, just good liquidity in the future. Yeah, go ahead. I, I can't understand why with the reduced cost on the fourth option. Oh, maybe I'm jumping ahead. You are. You're on option Thank four? Thank you. We're on option three. Yeah, I'm looking at it compared to four. I have a question on why four doesn't go down. Yeah. Yeah. So Paul, Paul had that same question. Um, so I've got a good answer for you. It's, it's $3 million cheaper somewhere. It doesn't go down because, um, because the debt's excluded. 
um, the school debt is excluded. So it's not, the school debt isn't in this chart. The school debt is to the taxpayer. So when it goes, gets a little more affordable in, um, in the option four, it's more affordable for the taxpayers. But it doesn't affect this chart because the only projects that are coming out of this chart are the DPW and the fire station. Thanks, Paul. That was good. Good heads up on that. Well, I'll explain it. I'll, I'll point it out when we get to option four. But that makes sense, right? I mean, again, if we're assuming debt exclusion for the school, it doesn't come out of here. Um, okay, so we're going to go, so again, option three, if you go to the last chart, you can see the impact on the taxpayers is about $700 as a high. And there's a summary at the end that kind of summarizes all the charts to some extent. So option four is the same as option three, except instead of addition at Crocker Farm, you're moving the sixth graders to the middle school. So there's, you don't have that new construction cost in the number. So it's, you can see it's 82 million instead of 89 million. Um, and so, um, Dorothy, what they were saying is, if you look at the, the star in the middle, it's the same as under option three, and the reason it's the same is because the school debt is not coming out of this, it's coming out of a debt exclusion. Um, so again, so, that's, so this chart stays pretty much exactly the same. Um, the debt ceiling gets a little, again, it creeps down a little bit better, um, and the debt exclusion impact gets better as well because the, the overall cost is a little bit less expensive. So you get under $700. So those were the first four options. And based on those four options, I felt we needed to develop a fifth option um, based just to see if we can afford this somehow. Um, and so that's where option five comes in. So, so this option is the same as option four, which is a two school option, a place in Fort River and Wildwood with a 600 student school. You're moving sixth grade to the middle school. And it's setting some cost caps on all the projects. So these cost caps were completely me guesstimating. So th these numbers will change. You, you know, this will be the discussion the town council and the town manager has to have with the school committee and all the other groups. Um, but just for illustration purposes and see if there's a way we can make this work um, by setting some cost caps in place that are within the ballpark of what those projects were coming in at, um, could we get the models to look more affordable? So for the library, basically the cost cap. Um, a question. Do you want to do a question now? Good. Um, so for the library, you know, there's two ways you could do a cap for the library. You could either ask them to reduce the overall cost of the project, or you could ask them to raise more funds. Um, so either way, what I said is the, the town cost would be 10 million, essentially. Um, so that's down from 15.9. So it's, it's a sizable drop. So that one, you know, you'd have to really look at. Again, this is not a proposal or a recommendation. This is just for illustration purposes of how you can play around with it. Um, the DPW, we just set at 30 million. So uh, I think when you escalate it, we had it at 38 million. We said, all right, if we do it in 2025, it has to be 30 million, can't be more than that. And if it has to be a phased in thing where you spend the 30 million in the f up front and then if funds become available in the future, you enhance it based on plans and then that could be an option as well. Um, but we capped it at 30 million. Um, the fire station, we capped at 20 million. And the new school, we capped at 75 million. All the years stay the same, all the assumptions stay the same, but essentially we just lowered the prices to put in some restrictions. Yeah? Andy? Yeah, go ahead. So I know this may sound outrageous, but in other words, the sooner we build these buildings, the less they're going to cost us. From a cost escalation standpoint, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. So I think from a cost escalation standpoint and also probably a borrowing percentage standpoint because as Kathy pointed out, people are borrowing at 3% now. Our financial advisor is projecting it will go up in the future. So the sooner we can borrow money, the better off we are. But can, can we, in terms of borrowing, if we're anticipating that we are going to have this, do you have to link the borrowing to a specific project? Okay. There is a thing called arbitrage. Um, so you can't borrow money at our 
tax reduced rate at 3 percent and then invest it someplace for 4 percent or 5 percent. That's illegal. It's called arbitrage. So we have to borrow the money when we need the money, and that's how the, our borrow, you'll hear from our fiscal advisor, and that's how they structure the debt as we, uh, we can't borrow a whole bunch of money and just sit on it for a whole long time. But if, if we had a strategy, and I'm, again, I'm going to do it in the spirit if you've just put some numbers yeah. in here. Um, you know, for s some of the things that are, if we're building a whole new building, building it in pieces, maybe some of that is more feasible than others. Um, the library, there was an estimate done of doing fundamental repairs to it. Um, and one of the ways the estimator did it was completely replace the roof, then do an elevator, and you didn't have to do them all at once. You could, you, you could go out with debt with, for five million or 10 when you had specific things like that attached to it, correct? Yeah. And I, and just, I know Northampton did some road repair that way, which we don't want to do. But again, if we wanted to grab a low, to free up cash for something else. So there'd be some ways of playing with this to get Lynn's sooner might be better in some ways. Yeah. So you would be going to the designs of the buildings and saying you can't have all of this, but there might be an understanding that at some point in the future uh, we might build or add on. Yeah, I mean, I, I've only been related to the school process. You know, in all, pretty much all processes, there's like a value engineering piece. So you, you propose something, and then sometimes you have to get the number down a little bit because what's initially proposed may not be affordable. Um, and you can design buildings so that future additions or future work is more easily done than otherwise. So yeah, I think that's right. So just thinking out of the box, do we ever consider renting instead of building, like a DPW building? Could that be something that's rented instead of built? Yeah, I don't know if there's a facility um, that exists that could do that, but it's, if, if there's something, it would be an option that could definitely be looked at. You'd have to have a long-term agreement because you don't want to be kicked out of a DPW, <laughs> DPW building. Uh, but. I know we've asked, I think what you've done is built the kind of thing, tool to show people what the kind of hard choices there are because going back to the original that we're maintaining only two and a half million on the everything else and looking at being in JCPC watching the requests come in, you know, which roads aren't going to get repaired or when the next boiler goes or does that mean no new vehicles? Right for quite some time, or no expense of new vehicles. We can buy a Jeep, but we can't buy a fire truck. And this also assumes doing all five projects or four projects, right? So that's right. the other assumption that, you know, town council, maybe you've discussed, maybe, I'm not sure if you've just uh, confirmed that, but all these options assume we're trying to do all the projects that, have, that are out there. And, um, and the model will allow us to just wipe one out altogether yeah, or yeah, say we're doing it the way I said, some could be done in a repair feature because mm -hmm. it's not a whole new building. Okay. And I guess to respond to Shelley's question from a moment ago, uh, in reality, because there is no DPW facility or fire station out there, would really the thinking outside of the box, I assume, would be is to um, work with a private developer to build something and then rent it back to us. Um, I would find it unlikely that that would work because our borrowing costs are always going to be lower than the private enterprise because we can get uh, tax-free uh, bonds, whereas a private developer cannot. Yeah, that's a good point. But their construction costs might be a lot lower. I mean, I just don't know. Yeah. yeah. Lynn is not, you know, I don't know enough on. Yeah, Lynn. Well, so those are things that we are, are, can explore and are exploring. Uh, the, one of the questions that popped up to us is if we had a design, build, rent sort of model, which is doable, where a private developer would come in, build a building, rent it back to us, they would get the revenue from the rent over a period of time, was whether some, a scenario like that, whether that would be subject to the net zero um, requirement because it's not a town building. And would people perceive that as a way that the town would be skirting the net zero bylaw, which is, it's, it's becoming more and more of a common practice among municipalities who are straddled with debt, is to have this 
um, model where they you, you commit to a 30, 50, 90 year lease to someone for a facility and then they they build it for you and they, they feel like they can manage it and make money off of it by with their uh, investors. So it is an option, but it's um, we have some unique situations that we would have to take into account if we went that route. Good. Mm -hmm. follow up? Just to um, another question to what you just said, even though the private builder is not subject to net zero, could we ask them as part of the building requirements to make it net zero? Yeah. <coughs> so in, in looking at this, I, 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 I like the options. I, I think it's very clear when you go through it. But I thought we were adding um, to the capital budget more money for sidewalks and roads. And since the other capital has been reduced, I don't know where that's going to happen, or is that another chart? So what we discussed is, if you look at the, any of the charts, before the debt kicks in, trying in these early years to put more money into roads and sidewalks um, before the debt for the projects kick in. Um, you know, that's something that JCPC is going to have to work with this year, but I think that was the thought originally was, we know these projects are going to happen, so in the next few years, can we increase the amount spent? Um, I just want to make sh sure we all see that even in your most optimistic option five, um, we're going out to the taxpayer for a, n a little over 500. Yeah, why don't I, can I finish just get to the summary table and then if there's, yeah. we can, before we keep going. Um, so again, this first one, it's 1.8 million, or this option five, sorry, is 1.8 million over, but I think that's a number that within the reserves the town has, um, above sort of the guidance that, um, around reserves, but, and also capital and operating that we could figure out 1.8 million if, you know, if this plan works. Um, it's under the debt ceiling. Um, we're still kind of looking at like how far under the debt ceiling do we want to stay, but this one is, you know, it's not right up against the ceiling, which is promising. Um, and then the impact on the, uh, the taxpayers, which is, again, it is sizable, but it's much lower than the other options, or lower than the other options. So this is just a, a little summary of all those things that you looked at to try to pull out some of the key numbers to compare them. Good. So I have, I have a couple of comments and then I'll uh, go around, look to my left and right to see um, comments and questions that come up. One is that um, just reporting from JCPC discussions for those who are not at JCPC meetings regularly, last year, um, JCPC um, put off some projects that we didn't think at that point were not needed. We just thought they weren't needed immediately. Um, and uh, so there's a question of how far we can continue to put off non-road projects without really harming either the functionality of the town or jeopardizing an issue that has been raised by the Dorothy before, which is um, building up uh, sort of a debt to capital that we're going to have to then dig out of in the future. Um, the other thing that gets back to a uh, point, just reserves are not figured into any of this. You weren't figuring on using um, any of our accumulated reserves, which is really where the um, starred amount would have to come yeah. from if we weren't going to reduce operating budgets. Yeah, I think there's different ways you could do it. You could use it to help there. You could use it to supplement JCPC's funding in certain years if you wanted to do it that way. Um, so, But you're right, that, that's not factored in for now just because it's not really close to some of the big numbers that we were talking about in terms of what we would need. Okay, just wanted to point that out. Lynn. It, it also does not include savings based on net zero. Right, yeah, and on the operating cost side, I, I note that, that from an operating cost perspective, right. there would be savings for all these buildings. So this is totally separate, and it may be more of a Paul question than you, sure. but I don't know. Whichever one you wants to take it. Library project, we keep hearing the year 2021. 
Is that the point at which a decision would be made as, as, as to whether or not they will receive the state funding? Is that, that is the point at which they must apply? And when, when would they actually start construction? What I'm really getting at is whether or not the year that's in here, which is 23, I believe, is the construction year. Yeah, so the, in 2021, according to the chart, the most recent chart I know of, um, that would be when the grant funding announcement happens, so, which I think is what you just said. That's when they would find out about the grant. Um, and then this chart, construction begins in 2023. Okay, yeah. so I have two more questions. On DPW and fire, we have feasibility studies. How long does it take to do the next, the schematics estimate? Under a year. Under a year. Mm -hmm. And then once you have schematics, then you go out for build. So if you were in fact going to go after those faster, you could reduce each of those down to, if we had the land, mm -hmm. to 2022. Right. Okay? And the school, is that's based on our best estimate coming yeah. out that of That assumes getting the MSBA, MSBA this next right. cycle. That is a ta challenge to the town. There you we're going to yep. rise to the occasion. Uh, but it, it reduces the cost by about 4% a year in the way he's budgeted in. Right. Um, but it loads it up on yeah, what else to, we don't have, have to spend on it. You know, I'm just looking at the free cash line. It's it's a lot thinner than you'd like it to be mm -hmm. <laughs> if you want it to be suddenly taking on debt service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you'll, you'll still have to plug everything in and see what, if it pushes you over and, and all those variables. Um, so this summary chart, again, I'll just quickly go through it. This is all five options. So they're laid out at the top, options one through five. The first line down, total principal costs. So this is the aggregate principal costs from all the projects under each option. So if, when you play around with it, that number will change if you change your assumptions. But from these five options, that's the aggregate principal cost. The line right below that is the net co principal cost of the town. So that would be less any grants um, that are available. So either the grants for the library and the school. Below that, just let you, remind you whether there was debt exclusion. So for all of them, one school, one library. Below that is the impact from the debt exclusion. So it's the max and the average. So on a, on a average home value of 354,000. So for option one, the max out of all the years would be $897, and the average over the life of the debt exclusion would be 613. Below that is whether the debt ceiling was breached under the model. So that's a big one of whether we could actually do it. Um, and then the last one was those stars that were on each of those charts at the top of how much are we over the available capital funds. That's the amount we were over under those options. So these are the five options. Again, there's countless other options. We can, will, look at, whatever, uh, whatever however you guide us. Um, but, and we can kind of com complete this chart for all of them so that you can compare apples to apples as best as possible. Okay. So I got a couple other slides and then wrap yeah. up and I'll show you the, um, the tool, which will be a relatively quick thing. Just wanted to check in on that. Okay, um, just real quick, one question that I had is an option four. Um, you have nothing in there about what might be a rental cost that the town would need to pay the region to use the middle school for sixth grade. It's on the next slide, yeah. Yeah, so there's a couple operating cost type things that we'll talk about, I'll okay. go through in a second, yep. And if you have a one school rebuild or whatever, then we also have that extra building space that could be used. You're reading ahead. You guys are all reading ahead, I can tell. It's not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, well, it's my fault. I would like to send these out before these meetings. I apologize, just, again, give okay. it a time and a thing. So why don't you go ahead yeah. and thrust the chart. Yeah. Um, so operating cost consideration, so as we discussed, net zero, um, this is all based on the upfront cost of getting to net zero. There would be significant operating cost reductions if we're generating all of our own um, you know, electricity and heat and not having to pay for those types of things. 
there would be a large op operating cost reduction, which is not factored in. You'd have to do some sort of life cycle cost analysis of what that overall amount would be, um, but that's certainly something that should be a consideration. Um, maintaining three school buildings will be more costly than two school buildings, so not even getting into the staffing issue per se, you just you have more square footage to manage. Um, if you have the three buildings, at roughly 80,000 square feet for Fort River and Wildwood, um, versus the square feet that we would have under a 600 student school building, which is um, 110,000 compared to 80,000 each. Um, you've just got less space to manage. And so the maintenance cost should be less, um, capital improvement cost in the future should be less, insurance cost should be less. Um, so just from sort of non-staffing, the uh, two buildings which should be less expensive. Um, staffing patterns will shift based on distribution of students. So under all, a couple of these models, there could be shifts of staffing. Um, overall staffing levels would still be a, a school committee town decision. So I know some people are like, well, will things go down? It's, it's really up to how the programming is set up. Um, and that's not something we can really project at this point. Um, and again, under these models, there's savings built into the operating budget. <coughs> if we do nothing, the budgets might be even more oppressed in the future. Um, and then lastly, uh, cost of potential agreement with the regional district. So uh, as someone mentioned, um, and some agreement would have to be worked out for the sixth grade to go to the middle school, and what the cost of that agreement, if any, would be, would have to be factored in. And then on the capital side, um, you know, pretty much under all of the options, if they happen in the relatively near future, we can remove a sizable chunk of the projects that are on, the, at least the schools specifically, um, from the 10-year capital plan. Um, I added two roofs, some new doors and windows, and there's, there's other things as well, but it gets you to seven million pretty quick. So really that's something that would happen under any of the options if they're done soon. Um, and then the earning potential of vacated sites. So not factored in is, well, if the fire station goes somewhere else and the fire station lot is available, what is that earning potential? Um, and same thing if you go from three schools to two schools and when the school sites is open, what is that earning potential? Um, which you know, would be significant depending on what, what is done with those sites. Um, next steps, so we'll talk about what other information um, you need in order to make the presentation to the full council, which I think is next week. And then I wanted to look at the capital projection tool. I'm in a second. I've secured it to be a version that I think would be um, suitable for like the public to use. It hides a lot of like the big nasty tables and gets it down to just those two charts that really show all the, the information so you can just plug in the numbers. Uh, and what I wanted to do was either let you or the full council pilot it for a week and just you use it, play with it, do whatever you want to it, and report back to me any, or share your feedback back to me any errors you see, any issues you see, any things you think would enhance it. You can see if we can enhance it in any way. Um, but let you all pilot it for a week or two, get that information back to me, and then we'll make those enhancements and try to get maybe a final version that could go live at some point soon. I think that'd be great because I just, um, I really liked it. I like this as a presentation, you know, as a handout mm -hmm. into talking through, but I think the modeling is particularly strong when you can say, okay, push this one off three years later. Um, you know, you showed us a big jump down when we reduced the cost, but if I remove one or, or say I'm not going for debts, I'm not going out after the taxpayer, and you say, well, you just blew up the whole thing then, but so people can just, I, so playing with it a little bit to see how easy it is for me um, to talk with the public, I mentioned to this in our district, we had a small meeting that I'd hope that this was gonna be developed and people were really excited about it, sure. um, saying that that would be very helpful to be thinking about this. Sure, okay. Cool. Um, sure. Did you, I just, did you yeah, something? I just wanted to go back to the question <clears throat> I asked. Uh, which is if we did not, if we were turned down by the uh, MSBA, mm -hmm. would we be able to go ahead and build a school, but we would probably have to drop one of the other capital projects? Yeah, to, you can, I think yeah. that'd be a good one to pop in there and see. My yeah. gut instinct is the town would not be able to afford 80 million on its own for just a school. Yeah. I mean, and do really any of the other projects. I mean, maybe one of the other projects, but that would be really tough, I think for the town to do, if you're talking about the 600 student school, 
um, which you know is somewhere in the 70, 80 million dollar range, um, to not have the MSBA funds for that, I think would be would blow that chart up in terms of the affordability. But I'm just thinking about how people feel. Yeah, no, and again, I think that's that, a good one to... Because then we have to get into all of that repairing and roof replacing and on things that people aren't happy with anyway. So Yeah, I think we could have a what-if session, you know, at some point and just have the model up and have people say, what if this? And we can plug it in and see how it plays, it plays out. Or you can, you know, you can do that with um, at your meetings. Yes. So I guess um, you've looked at what we would be able to remove on the capital cost considerations for the schools. Um, and I don't know if there is a good way to get fire DPW in library. So I've been asking them or looking at it closely during their JCPC presentation. So the fire department I asked, um, and they didn't really have anything on their 10 year capital plan that could come off um, other than the feasibility study itself. There, there wasn't anything there. Um, DPW, I thought I looked at it and I didn't see anything that looked like naturally it could come off, but I'll double check that. Um, and the library, my recollection from them is that they haven't been putting things on the JCPC plan because they've been anticipating the new building. And if they aren't going to get a new building, then a bunch of stuff would have to go on to the um, JCPC plan. But we're going to hear from them on Thursday, so I can ask that question. So I have a couple more. Yes, right? go ahead. Okay. Keep going. So if um, one of the things that the town is and the, Amherst is not unique, so this is not a criticism, but so often we build new buildings and then we say, gee, we hope they stay together and yeah. we don't properly budget for the ongoing upkeep so that building remains as good as the day it was built. And how, we obviously we have to take that into our operating and our other capital costs. Is there a formula we can find to use for that? I'm sure we can, and one easy one you could think of is take the savings you get in utilities and set it aside for future maintenance. Um, you know, you'll get a decent chunk of savings for each of those buildings from the utilities and maybe from the net zero requirement. Right. And maybe you stash that away in some sort of reserve to, to maintain those buildings in the future, but I'm sure we can find some more formulaic um, calculation. There are some places that are beginning to require that when new buildings are built, that is done. Right. Yeah. So it's not left um, to that consideration. Um, I guess I have a, I mean, basically we all live in an open environment, an open government environment. It's not clear to me how we can provide this as a test to the council without providing it to a test to everybody. <clears throat> hmm. Yeah, it would be a challenge. I mean, I think what Sean is saying is we want, with any software you put out, you always beta, beta test it before you release it to the public. Because if we release something and there's a cell that's wrong that we haven't discovered, and then everybody's been playing with it for a, two weeks, and, and it's, it just looks foolish. So it, you always would beta test it with real users versus just internal people using it. I don't disagree with that, Paul. I think it's a, it's a lovely idea. But in a world of open meeting and open books and FOIAs and everything else, how do we pr provide the access to town council or to the finance committee, which I think the, town, the rest of the town council would not be happy with, and you know, prevent other access? So this isn't perfect, but you know, the version we give you, we can call version one. You okay. play around with it, do what you need, get the feedback, and when we make updates to it, we'll call it version two. And the, and the version that gets posted on the website or however it's distributed, we'll make sure it's called version two. So if people are using one that is not labeled that, then they'll know they're using something that is not the most vetted or up to date. Um, I, I think you're right. Like, hope, hope theoretically, if we say don't share this yet, we're going to post it so everybody gets it the same way. Um, hopefully we can follow that. But if, if it does get out to some people, they just have to be aware that they're not using something that's been vetted. So, okay. I'd even call it beta one. Yeah, I like beta. In a town like Amherst, they understand the word beta. Yeah. <laughs> did you finish, Lynn? I did. Okay, I had one, and I don't think it affects the modeling, so it's actually a question Paul might know. When we do a major construction project, like in the middle of the town, so we had two big buildings that went up, do we ever have an estimate of the cost of municipal services on what happens with that? Um, 
while the construction's going on, whether it's police, fire, uh, road repair that's on our, in this case it would be particularly on our budget because we couldn't bill it to the developer, we're the developer. Um, and would we, do we ever have those numbers or could we put them together? And some of these sites would have a bigger impact on the town than others, so a major construction of tearing off a lot of material on Amity Street would probably be more disruptive or, you know, I don't know, same with the Wildwood and Fort River, but is there any way of doing guesstimates of that? And I don't consider them capital costs, I think of them operating budgets. So that's the first question. I'll just ask my second one. It's related to development. If we can't, as Annie said, we could look over at the operating budget and say spend a little less there. But if, how much of the uh, new growth revenue that we've been getting, if we started earmarking more of that to go into the capital budget, so take our regular piece, but a bigger share, how much, how tightly are we budgeted on the operating budget that that would send the schools into a tailspin or send departments in? I, you know, I don't have a sense of the wiggle room on that. So, just, oh, they told me I had to hold it. <laughs> I'm not good with microphones. Um, new growth is a big part of our overall budget calculation for revenues. To set part of it aside, I, I can't see how we could do that without operating budgets, school, town, library all taking a cut in their operating budgets. So on the presentation from last Thursday, you'll see that you'll see the new growth and we estimate 600,000. Sometimes it came out at a million, sometimes it went below that. Um, but if you look, we look at the 10 year average. So we're not saying, oh, look at these three years, we were awesome, because we're looking out when construction stops for whatever reason. So we budget at 600,000 and um, as an average. And so, and that's built into our operating budgets because we can, our property taxes only go up two and a half percent. So that's the difference when we, for a lot of our other expenses that are going up higher than that, like our um, OPEB and our um, Hampshire County retirement and things like that, that take higher than two and a half percent. So that's our cushion, not, it's not even a cushion, it's, it's, it's built into our budget for that. Um, in terms of, I assume you're talking about public construction projects, not private construction projects. Yeah, no, I was just thinking because we had two big private ones, we get some sense of the public service costs. They didn't have to absorb those. Um, you know, a, a, a guesstimate on what is a, so when we do it, we're in charge of fixing the roads and the sidewalks or rerouting the traffic. Mm -hmm. um, so those costs, you know, like costs for, um, any if you put out a contract that requires closing a road and they need police details to do that, they're responsible for that, to building that into the price of the construction project. That's not a cost. It's a cost the town bears, but it's, important, it's included into the capital cost of the project. So that would already be built into these estimates of a school that we have then? I think they have contingencies built in, so I think okay. it's probably not specifically outlined in it, but it's within the contingencies, I would say. What's not built in is what you might be referring to is <clears throat> suppose a intersection needs to be reconstructed for some reason. That's not built into any of these projects uh, at all. And, and, and the reason I'm asking is I know when we were looking at the old school project, the one that didn't get voted in, um, uh, there was talk about the number of buses that would have to be coming and going and that you might have to redo the intersection uh, on Strong Street when, where they came in to do something there, whether it was, you know, traffic lights. And I don't so, know whether there was ever an estimate, but that's a related cost to something that's new and expanded that's not disruptive in the same way. Oh. Right, so that specific question, I don't think any of those numbers ever came from the town or in an estimate of a need for an upgrade of that intersection. I think those were privately developed. That was nothing the DPW ever put forward, and I don't think they have, they have a sense that that's a requirement for that site already, for that intersection. Yeah, at least on the schools, there's a traffic analysis done part, as part of the feasibility schematic phase, uh, which I think generated that info. 
Okay, I'm looking around to see if there's anything else on the questions because I probably need to reserve a little bit going to discussion next is to... Andy, can I just do two minutes real quick? Yes. Okay. So this is the tool I'm going to send you. Um, all the cells have been locked except for certain ones, which are the ones you can play around with. So on this first page, it's essentially the base cost and these variables down here. I might do a little color coding to make it a little more visually obvious what ones you can um, adjust. And then, so that would be it for this first chart, and this would be for generating your cost estimates. And then on this page, it's everything that is highlighted yellow is what you can touch. So you can, um, year to begin, the number of years to bond, the cost would come from the first page, and then whether or not the debt exclude it. Um, and so as you play with these numbers, this chart would uh, adjust. You basically, once you touch the numbers, you have to save it. So you save it to your desktop, and then all the, the charts will adjust as you save it. Um, you can play around with the grant percentage um, for MSBA, so you can make different assumptions there. Also down below, it gives you the, this should say average, sorry, I gotta correct that. It says median. This is the impact on the average household um, under this, their, this option, whatever it is. Um, this is the max impact on the average household under these options for all the projects that are debt excluded. Um, this number is the amount that you're over the 10% levy, so this would be a, a cell just to look at. It's not something you would change, but it would calculate how much over the levy you are. Mm -hmm. And in this cell you could change, this would be ongoing capital. So if you wanted to play around with um, 3 million or 3.5 million, you would change this and that would change the size of that yellow bar um, for ongoing capital. And so all those charts that you've seen today are here. I might make a first page that's like instructions or something like that. Um, but the hope is to get this to you relatively soon. Again, do like a week or so of a pilot, get the feedback. Again, it could be just things that don't look good or that aren't working the way you'd expect or if there's other charts you think would be really helpful um, for demonstrating the, the different options, we can try to do that too. Um, I have a, yeah. Yes, uh, Lynn and then uh, Dorothy, then did, I'll look the other way. Going the other earlier page, did I see you not, that you were freezing the projected construction year? Um, no, you can change that down here. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it links up to here, but you can change it. Um, the one thing that I was just thinking about when we were talking about this that's going to be a little iffy for public use is, um, so if you change the base cost estimate, these cost estimates are based on a certain year that the architects were assuming. Mm -hmm. So if you change that, you're not really tying it to any year of construction, you're just sort of playing around with it, and that would impact how many years of escalation you're assuming. So I've got to think about how to organize that in a way that is user friendly. Um, that's the only issue I see on this page that I wasn't thinking about before. Uh, but you can t adjust the projected construction year, the net zero premium, and, and the cost escalation. Andy? Okay. Yeah, uh, Dorothy. Okay. Uh, I've seen this thing with many, many names. Uh, I would like you to have a clear name mm -hmm. so that I know what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, what, on your first page, what is the name you have right now? Of this whole thing? Your, your, your thing, your, yeah. uh, your okay. machine, your capital machine. I'm going to have to think about it. But when I send it to you, it'll have a name. Okay. 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 John Super X model. No, no. <laughs> You have done an amazing job. Um, I just, before we, if we're not criticizing, we're just anxious and I, to get me, our hands on it. If you heard the assessment method conversation, you know right. I love to name things, so. Um, how do you want the feedback? Um, I think email, I mean, you can call or email, I think would be most helpful. Email, just because I can start and sort of compile it and work on it and, all and at once. This is really a question to Andy. How do you want to do the distribution? Do you want to do it just to our group? meaning finance or to the whole council? Uh, let's hold that for just a second. Let me see if there are questions on the left. Okay, um, then getting back to your question, I think that we should talk about that as a group. Uh, I always like to do things, you know, I think that it's what's most helpful to you, Sean, um, because you, we could take it in concentric circles out uh, uh, the reality is that um, it's not going to help uh, unless it's really out in a useful form soon with making a decision that would be a different decision about whether or not we vote 
yes on what the school committee has already voted yes on uh, regarding statements of interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's really how, what we do after the statement of interest, but while we're still having the community as a whole consider the, the, the capital projects and understand the capital projects and what we're asking and um, suggesting and getting there. But um, I don't think that uh, the SOI deadline, decision deadline can be a factor in this. Is, am I correct on that? Yeah, I mean, again, today's presentation was, I mean, the major fact and the, the major determination in the SOI is, can you do the 600 student school or could you do replacement of both schools? And so the goal for today was to kind of give you a sense of the affordability of, of a three school option versus the two school option, which hopefully it illustrated that. Um, but you're right, I think in order, making the, the public tool, I don't think would be super helpful for the SOI vote. It's more for the bigger plan uh, vote, or not vote, but bigger planning. And the reason I pointed that out is just to get back to the committee, if, if it would be helpful to you to have it go out in sort of beta one, beta two, and then the final version so that you get the committee to look at it first since we've looked at it a little more, yeah. then get the rest of the council to look at it and then yeah, get idea. it out to the full. We could do it in the sequence and we could make it fairly rapid and make it very public as to what the deadline for the final version is mm -hmm. with your guidance, of course, and that would remove some of the anxiety that um, Lynn was uh, re referencing in the prior question that she asked. And, and I also think when this does go out, I mean, and I'll try to think this as I'm doing it, because I'm used to playing with models like this, but when I saw one that had been developed for the town a few years ago, I had to look up a bunch of terms so I could read what was in the spreadsheet, right. you know. A glossary I, of some sort. Or what? Like having a glossary of some sort. Yes, uh, exactly, you know, trying to think of the idiot glossary when I say, uh, affordable, I don't mean no tax increase, for right. example. I, I expected to get the affordable no tax increase, yeah. and when debt service overtry, that is a tax. And, you know, so just yeah. these terms that you have to in debt the ceiling. chart yeah, like uh, make short, or what's a reno of a school. So I'm, I'm going to keep in mind, like, which things people won't know. So when you go in, here are terms you seem to know, and then you're going to see it in the, the sheets. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes, Lynn. Um, Andy, I want to reiterate what you're saying, and that is this is really not the decision making for the SOI. Right. It, it really is the large capital plan. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to, and I'm, I'm drawing Paul into this, and that is, is this the type of thing that we want to have ready for that public forum? <clears throat> I think this would be very confusing to people. I mean, you're all bright people. You're seeing it for the second time now, and it's hard to grasp, all the third time, and it's hard to grasp and not totally understand it. So I think one thing Sean said, which was interesting, is to have some public sessions where someone could say, show me this, or they don't have to do it themselves. We could have sessions where we are doing it, show me it with the library eliminated. And they can and say in their words what they want, and we can walk through with folks. I think that's an option. But your question is, is this, I think Andy said, this is not, the SOI should not be contingent on this tool. Right. It really is a multi-month conversation you are going to be having amongst yourselves and with your, your constituents. And so I don't think we should tie this to that thing. I think the presentation that Sean did early on about affordability um, in terms of two schools versus one school, if you feel that that's necessary for the council to address, um, that might be something that can be put into a presentation based on this model. But the interactivity of the model, I don't think is critical to that conversation. I think we should talk about that yeah. since the feasibility study requires that we have to look at three options. And so the, the community's not ready to close off that conversation uh, based on everything MSBA is saying. So, I mean, the superintendent has put out a very responsible proposal, and we, frankly, have nice data on that. But 
the MSBA gives directions that there have to be some ex exploration of three options. And, and the schools and all of the process, should we be so fortunate to get the funding again from MSBA? You know, they're gonna debate things like, gee, is it educationally sound to send the sixth graders <coughs> to the middle school? Is it, you know, educationally sound to do it this way or that way? And our job as a council is to take this as we come up with a capital plan. So my question was really, we have a forum that's, I guess, in May, where we have to do, is it a forum or public hearing? Forum, forum where we have to do capital plan. Now, we could spend that time on the capital plan like we're discussing at JCPC, or we could spend it doing multiple workshops with this and give the public a play, an opportunity to play. So I, I just wanna leave those, uh, all those options open. Um, that doesn't mean the council has made its decision by then as to which one we wanna go with. It just means we're starting to get public input. Tell me. I just want to reiterate that I think it's important to share this with the community because I'm getting a lot of questions still about why are we not considering the three school option and and now that we know it's clear that the feasibility does require the three anyways so it's all a very transparent process and just now that we have a little more data even though it's approximate and not real but just giving people that view of what that looks like I think at least it will be helpful for people. And just making the whole, it feels like there's more transparency. Hey, this is the numbers we've got so far, just projections. This is what it's gonna look like and our, what our affordability looks like. And by the this, you're referring to the presentation we got at the beginning of the meeting, not the spreadsheet. This thing, this unnamed sheet. Uh, with the variables, that you can play with the variables that we don't think is available. I, I, when you say it's important to share, um, is, it, is it this? Well, in, in the least that, and then for the people who are more advanced and adventurous and want to go in themselves, give them that option, but in the least, though. Yeah. Well, that's why I said made the point that the spreadsheet's not going to be available in time for us before we have to make a decision at the council. And that's what Paul confirmed. Uh, but this piece is now, because it was presented at a public meeting, is now a document that should be available. Okay. And again, if, if you feel like a what if session would be helpful before, you know, if there's some idea out there that's with, uh, holding somebody up from voting a certain way and they want to see what it looks like. We could figure that out, um, you know, based on your timing. You, you, yeah. We're going to get this electronically, right? Yeah. Yep. 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 I think that will be helpful if yeah. someone can talk someone through what this shows. Um, I will say that one thing that you're not really considering is that I hear from so many people, we're not going to do all the projects. Right. And that's what they're saying. So. You haven't really built that in. One plan, one town? <laughs> um, no, right, so again, the major assumption here is trying to make, come up with a plan or a, a option where all the projects are done. I think, I haven't considered, but I also think the council is sort of, that's a conversation the council has to have about what you want to do. Yeah, so, so I can just add, so the, the mission to staff was, can we afford four projects? And that was what the delivery was, was here's how those four projects stack up. You can go in and zero out any of those projects, and then you, it'll change the chart when you are able to, you know, when this is out there. So you can say, I don't want to do DPW or library or fire, zero, zero, zero. What does it look like then? I wasn't talking about me playing with it. I was talking about public perception. So, but, but I think we can assure the public that it will be available before we have to make any of those decisions because um, 
each decision has a trigger point. Either it's going to be decided by the voters in a debt exclusion override, or it's got to be decided by the council in an authorization process to issue bonds, which requires two-thirds of the council. And we, as a council, would likely want to have significant process beforehand. So the spreadsheet plays into um, providing ex essential information for those discussions. But um, for the SOI, um, at this point, we're not at the override. We're not asking the voters to approve an override. We're just trying to see if there's agreement amongst the council to put in a request to let us get to that decision. So that brings us to the question. We're not going to try to bring this into Monday's presentation, or are we? I would think um, we could reference, I mean, I, it's ultimately um, decisions of the presenters, um, but uh, I think that if reference is made that we're continuing work on the interactive tool and um, it's now in a testing stage and will be available before critical decisions have to be made could be enough of a statement, I would think. I think that the uh, presentation of the PowerPoint is the more essential thing because it really does address um, the various school options, which are what people are so anxious to know about. So, but, so let's talk about two different things. We're yes. talking about the, the PowerPoint presentation and the tool. Let's say the tool isn't going to be ready by Monday, which is when your school, your council meets. The question is, do you want this presentation to the council or not? Because I don't think that that was an expectation by the school committee chair and the superintendent that they were going to be focused on the statement of interest presentation, if the council feels it needs additional information on this financial background, it could say what is the finance committee's recommendation or you could schedule a session to bring this additional information in. We could just keep it as a backup. I mean, they, you know, keep it as a backup option in case the discussion comes up and there is a need for pulling that out. But, but it does feel like the focus is on the SOI and, and and, and as a reference point, I think it took Sean an hour to go through the, um, a, a little bit over an hour to make the presentation <coughs> today. So we would, the chair, the president would need to build that into the evening. Yeah, no, I started to look at, say, can we look at just one, three, and five or some, you know, like, because explaining what you put into the G's will take time no matter what you do. Um, and you've tried to do it in such a balanced way of saying there were, yeah two cheap ways of two schools, which was the Renault way. I mean, cheaper, they're not cheap. <laughs> I struggle with that. Right. Yeah, Dorothy? Uh, I would like to ask if you could do uh, another option, which does not have a debt exclusion override. No debt exclusion that, that is one of the things that also that we've been told by a number of people, that tax increase is not something that some people can tolerate. They say they will move or whatever. So can there be some way to do it with the school without a debt exclusion override? Okay. So um, just to, for, so criteria would be no debt exclusion override, the school, and what else? Okay. Within 2020 to 2030? Because again, depending on how far you go out, you could. We can play with that. Right? We can play with yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the, the question of the SOI, we're getting back into that whole point, that the SOI submission ultimately is to give us options, which may be what we end up in our recommendation. Um, but we recognize that there are these issues out there, including the question of whether taxpayers can afford uh, any kind of a debt exclusion override and whether they will make that choice and there are others which project to put the debt exclusion override to, which to attach it to. Uh, you know, the select board's decision of several years ago was to attach it to um, these two projects. Um, but 
it could have been attached to DPW Fire Station on, in, in we could have not attached it to one of these other two projects. If, um, just if there were, I'm not saying for sure that this is a good idea, but if there were a simple way of saying your one new school, the 600, uh, with no debt exclusion, with the best case scenario where we've got the match, how much is left over for another project mm -hmm. um, without naming what the other project would be? You know, that there would be, and I just don't know whether that's worth doing. I can see it in these numbers. So what Dorothy's saying, she can't, you know, if someone is asking that, I can see what happens if we try to do all of them. We can't. Right. Um, so, I, I, Lynn, I just, I'm seeing you're nodding your head, but that's the only simple way I could say, you know, what's left if we fund the schools out of our own allocation. But unless I misunderstand this model, Every one of those questions can be answered with this model. Absolutely can be answered with this model. It's, all you do is take away. Yeah, it's easy to do with this. He can do it with his fingers right now. He could. <laughs> yeah. So it, I think the, the bottom line is this is not what the SOI depends on. What it's about. No. I, I totally agree. We're not making that decision. There's no recommendation here of any, just again. Right giving you a sense of portability, basically, or the cost of different projects and the timing. But you'll want to adjust. And if, if the tool gets ready, once it's beta tech, I can show people, I'll be able to do sessions to right. show people yeah. the answers to those questions, mm -hmm. yeah. So, anything else on this topic? Um, so I guess to getting back to the question of uh, the PowerPoint, it, it is correct that uh, um, it would seem unlikely, though I have to turn to the president of the council to answer it, that we could build in enough time to make the kind of presentation that would really present it. Otherwise, I think what we need to do, and it could be a part of the Finance Committee report, is not make a, not a report or recommendation, but to kind of find a way to report the results, the, the bottom line. Uh, if we had this presentation, we had this discussion, and the summary chart is, and I will work on that immediately and share it with Sean and Paul and the rest of you on the committee so that you see what I'm drafting. I've actually started a draft that was based upon last week's meeting, and I didn't, um, push it through because there was no council meeting this week, but um, then I would add to it and uh, um, get the draft um, completed of what would be a written finance committee report and get, um, get comments in the draft. And right now, unless it's been fixed, there's not an easy way to um, post our own packets for finance. So if this got attached as a background piece of material, not to be presented at the council meeting, or just some how you were referring to it and people would know how to find it is what I'm looking, you know, what they wouldn't have to email us. We, there would be a place to get it. Okay. We just figured that out. Yeah, I think we need, um, that's something that I've been concerned about and I don't particularly want to spend time today discussing yeah. it is how we can improve our um, online packet availability to provide information on various documents that we look at through time. So is there anything, if um, I just want to clarify, on the trial, which we haven't decided when that will start, we would take it out in concentric circles, starting with the Finance Committee, then the full council, then take it public? Okay. Yes. And as far as what I'm suggesting, and this is the important part, so I really want to make sure that we um, have an understanding of it. The basic report to the council that will be included in the Finance Committee report is really page 19 on the um, PowerPoint. And um, the question of how we got there is what we can't explore because we don't, we can't get into the depth of it. And that we don't, we aren't making a recommendation, we're just reporting this information. But we'll make the whole thing available. 
We will make the whole thing available when we figure out how we do that, yes. Um, particularly if you um, introduce it by saying this was, uh, the question was asked, can the town afford the four projects? And that's what this aims to show. So that we're not recommending any of this out of the other, but it answers that yes, it could. I think that's right. I would just be careful with the yes, it could. This was the question asked. Yes. Do, question mark. That's good. Um, <clears throat> the agenda item was really a consideration of the statement of interest. What we're really saying is this was the financial model for all capital plans even though that wasn't how it was listed in our agenda, right? So it's sort of number three and an attempt to give you information for number two. Um, so, you know, it looked at funding plans for the identified major projects. Again, not making an option, giving you options, not making a recommendation. And within that, you sh could gain some of the financial considerations to the SOI um, vote that's coming up. Um, around three schools versus two schools. Yes, go on, uh, Shalini. Is this something that w might be clarified on Monday, with, uh, what goes into the SOI? Is that something we're going to talk yeah, about? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. I think that's a good question to ask. Okay. A lot. There's a lot and, that goes into it, but that's a I good mean, in, in terms of from the financial information that we oh, yeah. should, nothing, um, not that. At this I, point, there is. Yeah, nothing. not much. Yeah. No, I think that the question, uh, that we will pose, uh, I assume, either in advance or that night is, once it gets to a feasibility phase, if it gets there, which we hope it will, if we're voting yes, um, that um, what questions are then op still open for discussion? And uh, I mean, that's just going to be a natural question that we all know is going to be asked at some point by somebody, so we just know it's out there. And uh, anything else on two or three? Because I want to um, keep an eye on the clock and keep moving because uh, it's already four o'clock. And I think we can get through the rest pretty quickly. I'm going to take a bath and break. Okay. So we'll take a two or three minute break. And, uh, the question came up about how many times the, we should be asking the superintendent to be with us and whether we can find a way to condense um, our process so that um, we, uh, the superintendent's time is um, preserved. And one thing I said I would do is contact the chair of the Committee on Finance in Northampton and find out how many times the, com the chair of the Committee on Finance came in, uh, to their um, combined process and the answer was one. And that was because they had a meeting of the, they have meetings that are joint meetings of the Finance Committee and the Council as a whole. Um, is this for the purpose of the regional budget? This is for the purpose of the regional budget. So my thought was that we have a regional school district budget hearing on April 2nd and that we urge all of the council to be at the budget hearing and that we ask the superintendent to make the budget presentation is the um, where he is present at the April 2nd meeting both to the council and to the public because a public hearing does not have to follow the same context of a um, public forum. The, super, the superintendent of schools and I have corresponded and he is not available on April 2nd, oh, yeah. but we he did change is the date to April available 4th. on April 4th. We changed that date to April 4th, you are correct, and I just changed my note on that. Um, but it still remains the same to, uh, what, what, I, what the suggestion would be is to receive the 
budget for initial discussion by this committee on the 26th with uh, Mr. Mangano um, asked the superintendent to be present on April 4th for the one pres for one presentation and then have us take a vote on April 9. At that point, it may be that the um, council is sufficiently informed and the committee is sufficiently comfortable that you could then go ahead and have the um, vote when originally scheduled and can cancel the additional meeting because we said April 22nd or 29th, we didn't we didn't say it had to be. We just asked the council to reserve that option, and that would give us the the ability after the public hearing and input we received there to make that decision as to whether um, the council might be comfortable going ahead and making the date the decision on the budget on that earlier date. So that's what just, I would propose. So then the finance committee would take our vote. Uh, we would still, that is when it was uh, previously scheduled that we would take the vote. We would stick with the April 9th date. And it may be April 9th when we make our final recommendation um, as to whether the council should go ahead and act on that earlier date. And then you're wondering if the full council is going to do it on April 22nd? Um, the... Uh, Yes, or we could, or or the committee could make that recommendation because that's ultimately, it's really up to the, it's the what the committee and you as president choose to do. Uh, I don't think that it needs a council vote as to when to take it up. It needs a council vote to approve the budget. So it, it, um, that would enable you to then cancel the additional meeting for the council if um, we felt comfortable. But the important thing is to encourage the, um, all counselors to attend on April 4th and that um, we ask the superintendent to make only one presentation regarding the regional school budget. Does that mean that you, you um, no vote. town council on the 22nd? Don't, don't take either date off. Don't take Just either date leave, off. Leave them on. And then the 23rd would be at 2 o'clock or at 6.30? 23rd is at 2. That's a regular meeting. That's a regular meeting of the Finance Committee, and that's not related to this. This, this, is, this is adding the 4th at 6.30, and then I guess the question is we probably have to point, post it as a joint meeting if enough counselors come, right? Yes. I've already informed the council of that meeting. I will, I will let them know again and ask them to uh, reply to Angela to let us know where we stand. So, so is that any comments on that? If not, um, I think the only things that we're gonna have are really quick if you have another meeting, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so is, is, if there's, is there any other follow-up discussion on points that we've uh, previously discussed? If not, I wanted to get to the questions that came out of um, the request that we review the committee charge. And what I was going to suggest is given the hour that we put this off till next week and put it on the agenda, but I have listed these questions, and if you have additional questions that you think that about the committee charge, um, and you have them now, please say them uh, so that I can add to the list. Um, if not, um, then uh, we'll, uh, you can also ask additional topics when we take it up next week. But um, I think that the major point is that the charter uh, doesn't require that the Finance Committee have non-voting citizen members. It enables the council to make the decision. And the committee charge provided that. So I think the question one I have is, 
um, given our experience now and what we know about the complexity of the material and the discussions, should we have citizen members? Second one is, if so, what number? Because it was four that would make this group go from five to nine. Um, the third one is whether there are any qualifications that or attributes of um, skills, whatever you might want to say, citizen members might bring to um, this committee by having them participate um, and whether that should be included in the charge. Uh, we sort of have, had, have reached the point when on the, the when question that we would, if we go forward with citizen members, people have already applied and that there would be a process um, that would uh, try and finish appointments to have terms begin on July 1st, but I do want to, that was a fourth question. And the fifth one I had was term length. Um, so I just responding to that out of rules, uh, since this was sent there first, our recommendation was that the terms be at least two years, um, not, not shorter than that, you know, for this non-resident and there was a strong, just so when we come back together, there was a strong view um, of at least a few of us that qualifications were critical for this reason and that one of the things that we could even consider two or three year terms if we wanted to stagger them and they would provide continuity over time to the finance committee. You know, so one of the things they'd be bringing to us is they'd be committing to us and we'd be committing back to them. So. I just want to bring back that discussion. And the last recommendation, Andy, that I think Lynn sent to you was that the interviews of choosing and figuring out among the pool would be done by the chair of the Finance Committee and brought back to the Finance Committee with us as a group seeing the full pool. So reopening the question whether it's two, three, or four, you know, we've posted it as four and people have applied. So I think it's hard to pull back from that, but but that we would be a deciding body with you doing interviews since you're the chair. So that, that just to bring, those were pieces that were recommended back. Um, yes, go ahead, I, Lynn. I believe that after the Finance Committee approves, it does go to the full council. Right, it goes, but then it goes back to the full council. So it doesn't stop with us, but that we're, a vetting process that then comes up with the names yeah. that go to the full council. I think that what's going to end up happening is, is that uh, we've recognized that um, there are council actions where more than one committee might make um, recommendations to the council before it makes its full decision. Um, so I thank you for that report. And it is helpful to know and valuable to know what. Um, the other committee thinks, but I think that our recommendation is going to be our recommendation, and uh, we should approach it independently from our particular expertise and what we understand from having functioned as a committee and um, our understanding of the complexities of the committee. And I, that um, so. I did add interview selection process. The reason I hadn't put that on initially is that that's not traditionally part of a committee charge. That's really a separate process, um, but it could be added to the charge, so I'm glad you did bring it up. Um, the whole issue of appointing and the process for appointing has been a major, major, I can't tell you how much time this has taken, of the um, outreach communication and appointing committee, uh, including an hour and a half consultation by phone with our town attorney and coming up with ways to do this that balances encouraging people to apply doesn't expose people and make them feel like they have to be out in public, and at the same time, completely respects open meeting law. And they're almost done. Uh, they're meeting on Monday, and they hope to complete 
a recommended practice of interviewing. Um, and the only change that really applies here is that the for the finance committee, which is the only committee of the council that has residents on it at this time, uh, the actual selection or recommendation of those would come from the finance chair after interviews. And that all of the other recommendations for town council appointees to non-standing committees would come from the outreach communication and appointing committee. This changes who would do it. That's that's one piece. Okay, I do have a follow-up question, but I may pause it, hold it till next week, because uh, at this point I've identified. I think the issues. I think we don't have time today to have that discussion, yes. and uh, so we should just. Uh, but be prepared to talk about it next week, which is what I wanted to do. That sounds great. So um, having said that, I um, don't think we have any minutes to approve. There's no public to make public comment. So the only question that I have left is whether there are any matters that the chair did not anticipate 48 hours before the meeting, but that you think are important for the committee to take up now. I think we should talk. I think we should talk about our recent budget hearing. That is actually, thank you, that is actually on the agenda and maybe it's, it's just, uh, um, and you're, do you have some thought on it? I just do. Real, the, um, I, I have some thought, okay. There was, a, a, someone um, wrote a comment about how this wasn't publicized, but the fact is, the, that Scott Mersbach wrote article after article in which he put finance committee budget hearing in the headline. So in terms of the newspaper, it was very well publicized. Uh, the, uh, the town is trying to publicize things purely by the, the website, and I will say that I think that's not a good idea. Obviously, the website's very important. Those people who know about it and use it uh, appreciate and that I've been seeing improvements on it, but um, I never looked at that until I ran for town council. It didn't cross my mind to look there. So an awful lot of people who may have thoughts about wanting to say something about the budget wouldn't look there. Um, so I'm going to say some things about possible ways to in, uh, improve publicity, but I'm also going to add what somebody said to me. She said, I said, why didn't they come out? It was definitely again and again it was in the paper, it wasn't listed. Uh, we had a great turnout at our, our district meeting. We had flyers uh, that announced it. George has sent out his own newsletter, which had it in it. Why did nobody show up? And the person who was somebody very well versed in town business said, that's because a lot of people thought it wouldn't make a difference. Now, I think that it would make a difference. So, um, that part, so we have to say, why would somebody need to come out at a night to go to a budget hearing. And um, I think that, that what we had said, and if we'd publicized it, that your voice is needed, we really want to hear from you, but found, finding a way to get that out. You cannot count on counselors to do it through email. We don't have the emails for most people in our district. And the business of getting them is very slow and bit by bit. So I don't have any way to actually email my people um, in any kind of way. I was thinking about um, the high school in Port Washington, where I lived for a number of years. It had a bulletin bar board, an electronic bulletin board outside the high school, which often didn't have anything on it. But when there was a special meeting, hearing, or school play or something, it was announced. So inside the building downstairs, you have a little electronic bullet board, bulletin board, which says what committees are meeting, which is fine. I don't, I don't think, I'm not saying to put that outside on the bulletin board. I think only big things should be on this. But that would be a clue that something big was happening if it were, in fact, on an electronic bulletin board somewhere in front of town hall. Um, 
so I realize this doesn't really answer how we're going to get people there. I think the presentation was excellent. I think that the people would have benefited and enjoyed being there. And um, I think that we want to get, we have other hearings planned. I really don't want to go to a lot of hearings if there's nobody there. So I think we all want to get the public there. And we're going to have to think of new ways to get them involved. Our, our existing systems are not sufficient at this time, is, is my opinion. Yeah. Um, following the hearing, I mean the public forum, um, I did two things. One was I asked Mandy Jo if she would be willing, even though it was not legally binding, to ask the members of the commission, the Charter Commission, whether or not answering questions during the public comment period could be counted toward the half of the time that would be public comment. And she has in the, she's in the process of that. She's heard from four. I've also asked Paul and framed a question for our legal, our town attorney of the same thing. Because my observation is that there were a few times, small as the audience may be, but remember we were on TV, where answering questions could have strongly enriched the content of the meeting and would signal to others that this is a time to come and have a little more than a dialogue than what people get when they do public comment at our meetings. So I just wanted to bring you all up to date on that issue. Yeah. Other comments, Shelley? I think it would be helpful as we, you know, know our dates and everything in advance to have all the dates, the important hearings and public forums date in one place, and then so throughout the year we are publicizing that, and people uh, through different channels, the, in, the district meetings, office hours, um, the public meetings, and so forth. So that's one thing, and I had another. I've forgotten. I'll come back to it. The, the one other thought I had, um, and I don't think it would have made a difference for this meeting in terms of turnout, but I think in terms of publicizing it for the next one, uh, the one comment we got that I thought was very insightful is that we were not previewing the possible budget for the coming year. We were looking mainly at the current year. And there was a reason for that, because we didn't know yet the state aid coming in, even though we had the tables. And I think something more concrete, that you are right in the, we're right in the middle of a budget process. So trying to figure out whether we redo the timing, if it could have been a, a week later, or um, if we don't have the exact numbers, we could at least be telling people that each of the budgets you see are going to be about 2.5% larger. You know, that's, that's where our growth is because it was hard to grapple with what people were being given. And so that's more on next year. So we could get it in flyers out, come get the first preview of next year's budget, come say what's important to you. You know, we could, we could play it up more. And I'm glad we didn't play it up that way because they wouldn't have gotten that if they'd come. So it's just a different way of thinking about the timing of it. And I know the charter says we have to do it by March 15th, so it may be there's no way of playing with the timing. Yeah, that, that, that was going to be my response, is yeah. that um, I think that at this point, charter says what the charter says, and um, that uh, putting the forum before the budget is presented by the town manager as opposed to after was a decision that the Charter Commission made and put into the Charter, uh, it makes the budget hearing that this committee holds more significant because that's what the one where it comes in after the um, budget is out and available to the public. And uh, but sort of gets back to what was the anticipation of the um, Commission and how can we take the charter as it is and make it most useful? Um, and uh, 
just to give you my, my one thought on the subject is close to what you're doing, but um, just saying, so here's the current year's budget. Um, what would you like to have been different in the current year's budget? And then it doesn't require speculation at all. It's something concrete people are reacting to. Um, and that would be something that, um, at least if there's a groundswell of um, public comment on a particular piece of the current year budget, uh, there would be an opportunity for the town manager to consider that before releasing um, his recommended budget on the We will be doing, just as finance, this past finance committee did guidelines, we'll be doing guidelines in the fall, which are setting the parameters. So we, you know, we can be thinking both the way you just said, Andy, but we can also be saying, here's the rough world we're living in, that there's a projected increase in revenues of X percent, and we've set these guidelines. So I'm just thinking of some way yeah. of making it feel very real that it's the right time to be talking. The, the guidelines were shared in terms of the percentage increase. I do think that, Kathy, you've mentioned this suggestion, Andy, I think you've added to it. I think looking at some real numbers, even if they were the present year, and then what would, what would happen if we went to the guidelines might make for a much more rich conversation, but there is a danger to that. Yeah, um, I mean, the other thing that I had thought about is uh, just trying, to, and I made this suggestion in another format, but um, suggesting that some group try and think about who are the people who you thought might have come but didn't, and actually do what Dorothy did a little bit of, and that is make some kind of a methodical survey. Why didn't you come? You know, did this? Did you know about it? Did you, this interest you? Did it not interest you? Why didn't you come? Uh, your your comment that you received was very helpful, but it would, uh, would it be richer if we did it on a more methodical basis? I don't think that that's this committee's um, role because it's the next forum won't be about finance. The next forum will be um, presumably about master plan and planning, and. Uh, that, um, so it's a question of what could be done in the next forum that would be helpful. Uh, and I guess my last comment, Dorothy, I appreciate what you said about the high school. It's hard for me to imagine what the central location is given what Amherst is like in a very skinny and long town north-south yes. and the fact that uh, people from your district go through downtown pretty frequently. Mm -hmm. People from far north and far south don't. And uh, the, so I'm not sure that solves all of our problem. Shalini. I, I just want to, again, reiterate, the people that I spoke to, uh, something to what Dorothy said, that if we promoted it as asking for, hey, this is your chance to come and give us feedback, what do you think about the budget? Like talking about it, not in technical terms, this is the public budget forum, which People said we didn't really know what that meant. So how we talk about it should be really simple and clear. The other thing I was going to say is now that they have that online forum uh, or online form, I think we can all go around and uh, I hope that the forum has a link. I haven't gone and I think I checked it, but I don't remember if there's a link to the presentation that was made. So we can tell people if you miss the budget, take a look at the presentation and then send us your um, feedback. So that's something we can all do. I, one other thing is somebody has suggested that we set up a way that questions can, can be submitted from people who are not in the audience. No, that'd be great. Good idea. That's if we're allowed to talk. Hey. Questions and comments. And yes, if we're allowed to talk. I just want to mention that we've been using the word hearing and forum interchangeably, but this last event was a hearing. I thought you said it was a hearing is the one where we can't talk. No, public forum. It, the public forum of, defined by the charter requires that half of the time has to be reserved 
Yes, it has to be reserved for public comment. The question is, what constitutes public comment? And if, if the council or the town manager have, you know, respond to a question or ask people to clarify, does that get counted towards the half time the public has, or does it get counted back toward the clock? I hearings. Think we need to, I think we need to adjourn. So yeah. and hearings, right. hearings, hearings do not have that restriction. Um, are we? Is there an agreement to adjourn? I think so. Just the housekeeping. Dorothy handed us all a set of minutes. I don't know whether we approved hers, and mine has typos in it. I can fix them, but I think we have to vote out our minutes at some point. Yeah. Um, I can send mine to, around again with the typos fixed in it. Okay, let's right. let's yeah. take nobody, care nobody of, commented on on mine, and I'm sure there's the errors and omissions. Let's uh, jointly make an effort to do minutes as the first item next week, and uh, that'll put the pressure on all of us. So, adjourned at 4:30. so we're adjourned at 4:30.